This was played August 13th, 1958. It was the sixth round. David Yonovich Bronstein was born February 19th, 1924 in Bila Tserkva, Ukraine. He passed away December 5th, 2006 at the age of 82. He learned to play chess when he was only six years old, having been taught by his grandfather. Once he reached international notoriety, Bronstein was Wasted no time proving that if someone wanted to unseat world champion Mikhail Botvinnik, they'd have to go through him. He shared first place in both the USSR Championship of 1948 as well as 49. He went on to tie Boleslavsky for first place in Budapest, the candidates tournament of 1950, and he won this subsequent playoff match, giving him the right to face Botvinnik in a world championship match. Now, now, interestingly enough, Budvinik had not played in the public scene since he'd won the world championship back in 1948, which Bronstein thought may have been a deliberate ploy to hide his opening preparation. Bronstein opened the first game with the Dutch defense, which was one of Botvinnik's favorite systems. Botvinnik later characterized this stratagem as naive. The match was closely fought, and by game 22, Bronstein actually led by a point, only needing to win one more or to draw twice in the last two games. The stage was set for a climactic final game in which Bronstein needed a victory since the champion would retain his title in the event of a tied match. The game proved to be somewhat controversial because Bronstein accepted a draw offer after only 22 moves. This engendered speculation that the Soviet government had ordered him not to beat Bodvinik. In a 1993 interview, Bronstein explained that there was no direct pressure to lose deliberately, but there was certainly psychological pressure in part caused by his father's several years in prison and what he labeled the marked preference for the institutional Bodvinik. Well, we've known that the Soviets had interfered on political grounds on many occasions with world championship matches. And it seems that there's hardly a world championship match without controversy since the title was held by the Soviets. Okay, well, that's David Bronstein, considered to be one of the greatest players in history not to have won the world champion's title. Bobby begins this game with E4, which, of course, became his bread and butter as white. E5, knight F3, knight C6, bishop B5 is the Ray Lopez opening. A6 is Morphy's defense and Bishop A4, the Columbus variation. Knight F6 castles and we have a closed Spanish with Bishop E7. Rook E1, pawn B5 and Bishop B3. And now we have a deferred Steinitz defense with pawn D6. Pawn C3 castles H3, preventing any intrusion on the G4 square. Knight D7, and D4 is a variation that we haven't seen overly too often. It is Karpov's variation. Of course, it wouldn't have been known that at the time, but that's what we know it as these days, named for Anatoly Karpov. Knight B6, and now Bishop E3. Usually we have knight bd2 with bishop f6 and knight f1. And the most common reply in this variation is rook e8. Coming back, Bobby played bishop e3. And rook b8 was played here, which is not liked by the annotator. More frequent pawn takes pawn is played. But rook b8 is the choice from Bronstein, and now the queen's knight comes to d2. Bishop f6, and here d5 was played, hitting the knight on f6. More frequent 
is the knight f1 move here d5 bobby's choice knight a5 and bishop c2 this knight on a5 now comes to c4 and knight takes knight and knight takes knight that puts pressure here and here so bishop c1 defending the pawn pawn c6 striking at the center and pawn takes the pawn queen c7 knight h2 and that clears the way for the pawn here on f2 to be pushed i thought he might should play pawn to b3 hitting the knight this is actually more consistent with Bobby's style. But actually, I do have A4 as another alternate. Okay, here it gives... Okay, it changed its mind. Funny that when you play B3, it says A4 is the best. But when you play A4, it says B3 is the best. Well, I had both in my notes. Knight H2 was the move chosen from Bobby Fischer. And Queen takes the pawn on C6. Now Knight G4 and Bishop back to E7 here. Knight to E3 and Bishop to E6 defends. Queen to E2 right here. Knight D5 was my preference and the bots as well. And that attacks the bishop here and threatens a fork. So it pretty much compels bishop takes knight. And then after you take with the pawn, the queen must be relocated. Coming back, queen e2 from Bobby. And the king's rook to d8. Rook to d1. Knight takes the knight. Bishop takes the knight. Here a5 was played, and you'll note that there are not many derogatory marks from our annotator here. This is chess at the highest level. Don't forget, this tournament would determine who would go on to the candidates, which would then in turn determine who would go on to face the world champion. So this is the highest level of chess, or at least approaching the highest level. After a5, bishop d3, battery attacking here. It is twice defended. Pawn a4, pawn a3, and now bishop f6 was played here. d5 was in my sight, the bot calling for g6. On d5, you get pawn takes the pawn, and bishop takes the pawn. Coming back, bishop f6 from Bronstein, and bishop c2 opening the d file. d5, pawn takes pawn, bishop takes pawn, now queen g4. Lining up here with the king, bishop back to e6, hits the queen, and queen g3. And now bishop c4 was played, and bishop g5. And that opens the e-file with the potential of the rook on d1 sliding over and attacking by super attack the e5 square. h4 first is also a thought here. See what we get there, a star. But bishop g5. Rook e8 defends. And here the bot called for g6. I thought simply trading would be a move because that vacates the f6 square for the queen. Although after queen takes the bishop, you probably don't want to play queen f6, but pawn f6 hitting the queen, right? Yes. Rook e8 was played. Now bishop takes bishop and queen takes bishop. Rook d2, ready to double his rooks. Rook bd8, taking his share of the open d file. Queen's rook to d1. Rook takes rook. Rook takes rook. Pawn h5. Resolving his back rank weakness. Queen e3. Queen f4. Willing to weaken his structure for simplification. Bobby played queen e1 right here. Pawn h4. It gets an inaccuracy from the bot, one of the few derogatory marks we've seen in this game. There are some surely definite shortcomings to this move. First of all, because this E-man is terminally pinned by our queen, I mean that because even though I said his back rank weakness was resolved, we control this h7 square with our bishop. So as you can see here, this square is perfectly safe for our rook to hit the queen and to hit this pawn that just moved to h4. So it's probably better 
even though the bot is calling for queen to g5, I thought it would be better to play g6 and support the h-man and give this king a little more space here. I get a star for that idea. h4 was Bronstein's move, however, and rook d4 was, in fact, played. And queen f6, now queen e4, battery attacking this pawn. I didn't think this was the best way to attack the pawn because when you make the queen the spearhead of your battery, this pawn will no longer be pinned if you were to come over here. So in other words, our rook is only safe because the pawn is pinned. So what would be another way to attack this pawn? Well, we could super attack by discovery pawn f3 with a super attack and the queen defending the rook instead bobby did go with queen e4 which no doubt is enticing because of the bead it also has on the h7 square and for that reason the diagonal is cut off by g6 well rook d2 was played here queen f4 hitting the rook and bobby played rook back to d1 moving it to safety and preventing this queen from coming to the back rank but as you can see the green arrow points queen to e1 which protects the rook covers that c1 square but leaves the rook free to advance into enemy territory for example if king g7 here i've got rook d7 right there Rook d1 was played, and queen takes the queen. You could probably still play king g7 here. It's probably a little bit wilder. Maybe queen c6. Queen c6 not liked by the bot, maybe because of rook e6. Then queen d7, and you can battery attack this way while battery defending that way. Anyway, it was just a thought. Queen takes queen, does get a star, and bishop takes the queen, leaving us with a bishop rook versus bishop rook endgame. King f8, rook d7, rook b8, pawn g3, pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn, bishop e6, hitting the rook, rook back to d2, king e7, pawn h4, pawn f5, hitting the bishop, bishop to c2, rook h8, king f2, bishop c4, king e3, king e6, and here rook f2 gets a question mark. And I think it gets a question mark because it relinquishes control of the D file, which allows black to take control of the D file with rook D8. So king F3 seems preferable, doesn't it? Or perhaps bishop D1 with the hope of bishop F3. Let's see what we get here. A star here as well. But rook F2 from Fisher. King d6, interesting. The bot calling for king f6. Hmm. And it does, hmm, king f6. That's a hard move to play right in line with your opponent's rook, especially with a bishop super attacking. Yeah, I guess. All right, well, king d6 was played from Bronstein, and now the rook comes back where it belongs to the open file, and king e7. Well, rook back to f2 here. Yeah, bishop d1, same comment as on the previous iteration of rook f2. And it could be Bobby is looking for a couple of incremental repetitions. Remember, grandmasters would repeat to click the move counter up towards satisfying the time control. This is move 52, and it could be that they needed to gain some time. Well, king e6 was played here, rook d2. Yeah, that seems to imply that Bobby just needs to click up a couple of moves. g5, pawn takes pawn, rook h3. King f2 defends. Don't play king f3. By the way, that would be a mistake because f4 attacks the pinned piece, and then you are a goner. Well, I guess you could push this pawn. You're going to lose that pawn, but you can can see this does not bode well for white i'd have to get out of check rook e3 is just so strong here okay come back so breaking the pin 
king f2 was played rook h2 check and even though white is up upon black is compensated with more active pieces his bishop is far better than ours so king e1 he gives check king back to f2 he plays e4 here he should just repeat the position and renew the skewer but it really doesn't matter because he picks up his repetition here after bishop d1 note that f1 is defended and so rook f1 and he gets a repetition anyway so king e3 rook e1 check king f2 rook f1 check king e3 rook e1 check king f2 and the game was drawn very strong game let me give you the numbers on this game 95.3 accuracy for fisher 96.1 accuracy for bronstein 2900 single game assessment for fisher 2950 single game assessment for bronstein a very competitive game a very balanced opening a impeccable middle game by both and a impeccable end game by both what we didn't see a single mistake did we we saw one or two inaccuracies but it doesn't get much better than that that's chess at the highest level and keep in mind this was fisher's first truly international event wasn't it so very impressive indeed a reminder that bobby fisher was but 15 years old at the time of this event